Mic test one. Mic test one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. One, two, three, four, five. Sir, sir. It's not working. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. So whenever you guys uh, want to start, you just turn the microphone off. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, Mark is going to introduce us, so he'll do that. We'll. we'll, we'll, we'll okay. I don't know. I didn't ask Mark. Turn your phone off. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm glad to see so many students here. Um, I'm super happy to see everybody underneath the sky for a difference, which is a kind of fantastic um, LA kind of scenario we have tonight. We have the sunset, we have the backward drop, we have the fires, uh, the air quality problem, and the trailing ends of rush hour tonight. So with that, um, uh, I, I'd like to uh, introduce Simpar a uh, collaborative uh, between uh, Matt Lynch and Stephen Badgett uh, with a, a peripheral and yet strangely uh, powerful involvement from Steve Rawl of the Center for Land Use Interpretation, which you may know as Louie, um, uh, another uh, generator of deeply strange and wonderful projects on Los Angeles. Um, to start then with Simpark, the most obvious thing to start with uh, uh, with Simpark is plagiarism, which we might as well start with tonight, um, uh, and that is the name, which they stole from Sire. Um, so they've been uh, stole 
uh, appropriated uh, or um, improved upon uh, an improvement of sci art, simp art, uh, despite the fact that they are not architects. Um, insistently, they identify themselves when pressed, they identify themselves as artists working on the scale of architecture. Um, whatever that means to them, I hope will be clearer to you tonight. Um, but one thing that I thought was really interesting and entertaining from their own self-definition on their webpage is as follows. An ethos for SIMPAR, which they define as an armature for social interaction through experiments with material and design, um, which at SIARC, that is the unimproved SIMPAR, SIARC would have simply been called architecture in this case would be called something else, which is up to them to appropriate and to improve on. Um, so with that, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and let them uh, introduce uh, their own complicated interactions through uh, a whole lot of projects that we're gonna see tonight. So, Simpar. Thanks for coming. Can you hear that? Does, does that work? No. Try it again. Boom, tsh, boom, boom, tsh. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, the mechanics of the lecture will be that we will uh, briefly introduce our beginnings from '96 to '99. Uh, jump straight to 2006, which will involve Steve Rowell's um, uh, and our recent project, which is still up or at least half of it is, in Cincinnati at the Zaha Hadid uh, Contemporary Art Center. And then we'll go back to 2000 and finish at 2005. Um, seemed like the thing to do. So what we'll do is fly through the early days. Um, maybe it's appropriate to say that Steve and I both studied art um, and began doing art projects that had a scale of architecture and kind of w one thing led to another. and forced to, we are backed into a corner and had to give, our, give ourselves a name, so uh, having recently seen an off-ramp publication, um, that was on our mind. You, you were on our mind. So. so yeah, we met in New Mexico in 96 uh, and decided to uh, do some projects in this small town of Las Cruces, um, uh, which was, the first one was uh, the sign of a manufactured home called um, just Big Big Whitey. Estrada Road Manufactured Home, but uh, also Big Whitey. Um, and so we found ourselves transplanted there from the Midwest and noticed uh, a lot of these trailers sort of sitting located out in the desert, um, somewhat dropped in place. Um, and we did a little research about where trailers came from and the military connection and. The, seeing that the contemporary history through a primitive culture interest that fascinates the Southwest. Right? Yeah, so it's basically sticks and plastic uh, cable tied together, and um, uh, we actually we made a video for this kind of a, a little history video on trailer uh, trailers, and trailer parks. Uh, so that was for a. Uh, event we held called Just Looking's Just Fine, where we invited um, artists in the area that didn't have a venue uh, to also exhibit their work. The, the, the structure acted as a beacon and kind of advertised this event in this rural pecan grove. The next project uh, also about trailers, um, this was called Hell's Trailer. Um, well, actually, this is its current, uh, it's current, currently exhibited in Cincinnati at the Center for uh, Contemporary Art Center. Contemporary Art Center. It's in a uh, kind of an all ages, hands on portion of the Contemporary Art Center. So they had us change the name to what is it? Uh, the Rock, Rock and Trailer. Rock and Trailer. Um, and <laughs> you'll see why. Uh, so it's made with uh, billboards uh, fr uh, from a billboard graveyard that was in, in Las Cruces, uh, collaged together. Made from the ground up, made to go through a double doorway in a gallery in El Paso originally. So uh, while it might have been easier to find and modify a trailer, this is built from the ground up 
on a shoestring, salvaged or surplus fabric, uh, stuffed with carpet padding from wherever we could get it, stuff like that. But so it, we continue the form around uh, around the trailer onto the bottom, so it rocks when several, a couple people or a bunch of people. It's our first video. Outside. We are the the uh, idea that went with this was if if you can't roll, you may as well rock. Um, and also, this was gleaned from seeing a lot of these trailers in the in the backyard. It was just kind of docked after probably a long life of uh, leisure. Well, leisure time you never get to. That led to a um, couple of projects. A chapel. Yeah, we built a chapel. In Santa Fe. <laughs> no, we were responding to this chapel in Santa Fe uh, called the Loretto Chapel. In, in, and they had this uh, famous staircase built in 1897 called the Miraculous Staircase. And so it has a, maybe um, a mystique around it. Maybe a biblical figure came and, and built it. Um, there's a story behind it. And it's a kind of a woodworking curiosity because it's there's not a central post and it's been x-rayed to see where the nails were, if there were any, I can't remember. But, yeah. but it, you can pay whatever amount of money and go in and enjoy the audio presentation about the history of it and kind of uh, see the chapel. So we built this top piece, which is not, uh, these are two different pieces, the top and the bottom one. The first, the one on the top is called Rise Over Run, which is the response to the Loretto Chapel stairway. And ours is miraculous because we did it in five days, and then um, it actually supported people. Um, it was a build design project. Right. So just, yeah. And Much the same as the, the lower one. The lower one is, uh, we were invited to go to Germany in 1998 to do the um, uh, cultural exchange with other New Mexico artists. and so. We did this piece called uh, Deutsche Joggernaut, um, which is again, you know, wooden fabric piece, uh, a mountain, a sign of a mountain. Um, but this one's on wheels, so it could be pushed you know, and walked across, journeyed over across the top. All right, so I think that brings us to our recent project with Steve Rowell. Uh, we were socializing instead of uh, working this out. We're, we're going to work it out. <laughs> gonna, this was uh, a project in Cincinnati in, in two spaces um, at their uh, center for what is it? the Contemporary, Contemporary Arts Center. The <laughs> <laughs> Zaha. It's a Zaha building, a wonderful building, and uh, in the lobby of that building. And across the street, the Western Art Gallery, which is a city, the city gallery that's attached to the theater. Um, the the staffs at, at those build museums. Uh, realized that their glass lobby spaces might be a good opportunity for us to tie them together and maybe we've done that so we'll show you how that worked but one of these shows at the Contemporary Arts Center is still up until October 1st as it says and the other one came down a month after it opened so uh, it was kind of a two-part experience but designed to be seen um, as, one, as separate entities as well a macro and a micro. Yeah. Uh, we were reusing some ceiling tiles from a previous project, um, and we just decided to intervene in the lobby um, of the Hadid building with uh, a drop ceiling with this silhouette of a B-2 bomber. Um, and so that included an audio audio content uh, that Steve put together. Um, so we had a, a set of parts that we were interested in bringing to the lobby space which had its maybe had its problems or unresolvedness and um, our, our set of parts was incomplete and Steve had some parts that were just right I think. So we kind of made steps towards a, a solution but couldn't finish it until we were all there together. Yeah, very last minute, but that's usually how it goes, I guess. Um, yeah, I actually, uh, I think we were talking about um, what you're going to do with this project. Is this mic loud enough now, too? Um, and uh, uh, the previous summer, Steve Badgett was out at the Desert Research Station here doing some work, and um, I began this project, kind of an independent project, just to confuse you more. Um, it wasn't C 
celio I associated, but it happened to be kind of uh, taking place at the Desert Research Station because uh, it's a place for doing desert research and it's largely an empty building uh, with no staff, so it was perfect for what I needed. Uh, it's a sonic boom archive. It's this project. It's uh, a full year, February of 06 to 07, uh, in which I'm recording, uh, monitoring, or uh, listening uh, with these computers and recording the sounds of sonic booms in the airspace above. Um, it's not actually me recording, it's the computer. So I, you know, presently there's uh, some computers sitting out there, just sitting, listening, buffering. When they hear one of these events at a certain decibel level, it'll record it, uh, capturing the kind of pre and post boom. Because uh, if you don't know, a sonic boom is actually incredibly uh, 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 short in the duration. Uh, so milliseconds, basically, usually a double boom, uh, but it can be incredibly loud, so it's a very difficult thing to uh, mic. And I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm actually going to be doing a talk in a couple of weeks at Telic, uh, as part of this LA Forum event, um, you know, October 5th with the LA Urban Rangers, kind of a split night, so it'll be about half an hour of me playing incredibly loud stuff, earplugs provided. Um, so it might be the one lecture you go to in which I actually give you earplugs to not listen to me talk. It could be, or anyone talk for that matter. It could be nice. Uh, but I think that the idea of, of, of that project that I was working on at the time with some of the ideas that, that you all were working with um, and the materials with the, with the acoustic tiling uh, seemed to make sense. Uh, and then once you know, the shape came in, once the V2 came in, the idea of bombing history of, uh, it, it kind of made sense, I guess, to, to bring me in with these parts, these missing pieces. Um, weirdly enough, the, the B2 is a subsonic craft. It's actually like 680 miles an hour, as fast as it can go. So um, that's where the other piece comes in, which is primarily a sonic boom simulator that we'll show you in a little bit. It's an anechoic chamber that we built that will uh, demonstrate the sonic booms. Uh, or maybe we could keep talking about this one still. I mean, there's five images of this, and then the, the other ones. So, so then I guess the big problem was, you know, so we have all the sonic boom recording material. How do we work it into uh, a piece that involves subsonic? Um, and there was a notion of, yeah, you know, the idea of this as being the iconic uh, shape or the iconic um, image of military power in America, and bombing being the kind of primary way in which America does its its job abroad, if that's a good way to put it. Um, so a few years back, about three, uh, four years ago, I recorded um, the beginnings of the bombing of Baghdad through this uh, live webcam and streaming. It was basically like a publicly accessible uh, stream anyone could, could, uh, could plug into, and I just happened to be recording. So I got this, I captured this brief moment of kind of a pre- during and post shock and awe phase of the current conflict, and it was just this kind of recording project, and it just sat idling, you know, or basically uh, on the back burner for many years. And that seemed to be uh, this seemed to be a good place to use that. So we, I created this piece, quote unquote, it's basically just a playback of a recording um, with uh, this Baghdad webcam mixed in with some kind of incidental sounds uh, from the sonic boom. Uh, and in both cases, it's kind of like the incidental between the actual explosions of the bombs um, and the, in between the sonic boom. So we hear kind of a combination of those two. Um, before I play it back, I just want to mention there's one, uh, so that was kind of like a, a, a looping piece, but we, um, uh, there was a piece, so there's this element in that which is a dynamic uh, element. There's a computer that was hooked up to the internet and whenever it would receive an email that um, included a certain keyword, it would trigger a sound. So these are basically Google news alerts. So whenever there was a news alert that you know, featured bombing or Baghdad or Simpark, uh, they would play back an explosion or a boom or a chant, like one of these sounds. Um, so it's really very much kind of just a playback of a documentation uh, that I created versus actually constructing a sound piece. So maybe we can play that back now. Yeah, I think this is the right image for that. Yeah, uh, and just to describe quickly, we had uh, a pretty elaborate sound system uh, four subwoofers in these black boxes. You can probably see one or two at the base of these columns and eight speakers in the ceilings, uh, four in the white, four in the black, the white being the left channel, the black being the right channel. Um, so let's see, you really can't get the, the full effect, but this is probably the closest we can come to it. If only. If only.
Yeah, this is like most of the ambient of the pre-bombing phase of Baghdad, and then you'll hear some sounds of birds and wind. That's the Mojave Desert sounds. So that basically is like an hour-long loop um, that has been going for the past four months, <laughs> 24 hours a day apparently. Um, uh, and it's kind of interesting to, to be able to track how many of these uh, news alerts um, are affecting the sound space in the lobby. Um, because I can, I can keep track of those just by looking at how many emails I've received through this particular account. And there's been about 3,200 um, kind of sound interactions through this completely automated uh, dynamic system that's, you know, separate from any of us here. Yeah, so that's just, that's in the lobby as you walk in, uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it can be in the background or it can come more to the foreground and depending on how you circulate, you get a kind of a different sense of it. One of the limitations uh, that we found interesting about the opportunity was that the lobby had to remain available for renting out for parties and stuff. So we kind of, I'm not, we didn't really try, but we couldn't, I don't think we could have put anything on the floor. So this was a great way to kind of solve those problems and have this presence and, and, and be uh, invisible in this kind of banquet that might be there anytime. That's great. about a block away at their uh, city art space, uh, the Western Gallery. And so this was- Cesar Pelli. Cesar Pelli building. Um, uh, we imagine, thought maybe he was, well, we're not sure why they chose him, but um, so for us, we were building, again, um, building and designing as we went, just kind of a quick um, fabrication for a, a volume for, uh, um, a hot house, uh, a hot house like a um, police or enforcement training room on the bottom, and then the uh, the second floor was um, basically the the chamber, the almost like our inexpensive anechoic chamber um, where the booms were uh, showcased. Were showcased, yeah. So th we'll talk more about the first floor later because this is sort of a, a, a an earlier project that was used to help. F um, justify the vertical space um, and give the kind of presence that we needed, I think. Some of the uh, designs, um, computer-generated designs, Steve's design is on the right, um, and then uh, what a student, a student. Matt's is on the left. Uh, um, do you want to say anything about the design? Um, well, <clears throat> this was my first SketchUp project. Uh, if any of you know what SketchUp is, so 
Uh, it's, it's a little, it's a little crude, and measurements are completely uh, arbitrary. But somehow, uh, Steve and Matt took them fairly literally. And when I arrived <laughs> in Cincinnati, I was pretty amazed that they could pull this thing off, even though it kind of defies physics in a weird way. And make I think one adjustment. Otherwise, we actually fit it into this building uh, with like about a three-inch um, tolerance at the top of one of these horns. We're calling these kind of cones or horns coming up off the roof. But I guess the, the basic idea, I mean, it's just to think of a way to not just have speakers in a room playing back sounds. I mean, uh, it seemed to make sense to treat the actual you know, sound waves coming from the speakers as kind of defining elements for the roof line in this building, uh, but also it serves to uh, kind of imitate a trajectory of sound. So if you're beneath, say, a military airspace, such as um, most of the uh, Mojave Desert, uh, these sound waves will just, you know, come kind of crashing down on you at this point, a 20 mile wide swath basically of sound and uh, a lot of the early kind of sonic boom simulators, the early tests in the 60s that uh, NASA did with the U.S. Air Force, um, they would have these cinder block houses built out in Edwards and just put people in them, you know, fly planes overhead and give them sheets to uh, tally how annoying these sounds were, um, you know, depending on how close uh, the plane was to them, how fast it was going, even though it doesn't really matter for sonic booms if you're over a threshold, and um, just this kind of one to five system of how annoying these sounds were, and they apparently gathered some data from that, and so we were trying to duplicate a little bit of that history in, in the structure itself. I don't know why that movement didn't happen. Well, a couple of details. Uh, we, just, we built rather randomly kind of on the fly tried to make it as uh, unthought about as possible um, but but still match the facilities in Wendover <laughs> with the, the T111 sighting here <laughs> yeah right. that's the uh, the kind of don't know the material on the right beneath the white yeah a great advancement in uh, industrial <laughs> wood engineering that <laughs> is readily available at the right price it, and it, it's designed to soak up more paint I think yeah, the keep product's the moving. Industry. Keep the paint companies going. So I don't know where you want to put the sound. There's this one and there's another interior shot of Dennis uh, sitting there. We could do this, maybe, uh, since it shows the two. I mean, do you want to explain the chair, the chase lounge a little bit? We were intrigued with uh, an article from the Washington, Washington Post uh, that one of the um, employees at the museum uh, showed us about uh, the B-2 bomber pilots um, generally doing 25 to 30 hour missions uh, from, is it, I think, Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. So the secret plane can't really land on faraway bases. Uh, they just keep it, they refuel. So the pilots are in the air for almost, you know, at times 30 hours. And um, they, they didn't allow for any kind of sleeping arrangements. So the article was basically about how the, this began with the pilot going to Walmart um, before the mission and buying a chaise lounge so so he and the co-pilot could switch off taking naps um, so they they placed the chaise lounge um, sort of a, above the engine or near the engines and a little bit to the back um, and the article went into uh, sleep needs how long you should sleep and how they're really examining that because of the the change in warfare meaning that you got these remote bomber bombers coming and doing their job returning home on the same just on the same day uh, so anyway we the, went the, and bought a few of these chair these chase lounges the two billion dollar plane with the eight dollar sleeping facility yeah so it's curious to us about the human factor in, in war lately how um, yeah the pilots are I don't know almost uh, vestigial yeah, because I mean, a lot of the uh, aerodynamics don't really allow for human piloting, and so the planes aren't really meant to fly so much without computers constantly adjusting it every you know, many, many times a second. The flying wing, yeah. So, do you want to talk about the materials, the, like the our kind of cheap uh, anechoic chamber? We did our best to insulate and keep the sound in and keep the acoustics appropriate to listening to the sonic boom tracks. Um, so it's a combination of homosote and carpet backing uh, and with the uh, yeah. insulation. So it's far from a real anechoic chamber, which yeah. <laughs> might be an underground. Uh, still, it's kind of amazingly expensive for the cheapest materials because there's so much surface area. Um, 
And so the speakers that we use are the speakers that we're using here tonight, the same ones we just had them return, um, uh, the 450 watt uh, pre-amplified powered speakers. Uh, and they really did the job pretty well. I mean, um, we had earplugs available outside the uh, uh, building during the opening. It was about halfway up to what it could have been, and people couldn't stand it. I think it was on the threshold of being um, unhealthy. So they turned it back a little bit. Um, but people loved it, kids especially. And so I have like a, <laughs> I've got like a little two-minute sample here. It's like a, a, a ten-minute piece, basically, just looped with a ten-minute bit of silence in between. Whoops, wrong one. Sorry. Whoa, sorry, sorry, goodness, terrible. Sorry about that. Still on? Yeah. So uh, a lot of that was, um, you know, jet sound flying over or the kind of before and after. Um, so that was all kind of part of the process of uh, how sensitive to make the microphones, how to adjust the levels. Uh, this is still very much a work in progress because whenever there's rain, you know, the sound of the rain on the roof of the building uh, will trigger the, the, the microphones as well. And uh, the booms, of course, you know, unless the plane is directly overhead, there's no. Um, uh, way to, to tell when this sound's coming. So it's this incredibly abrupt uh, and, and very surprising sound. And beneath the Desert Research, uh, or the Desert Research Station is uh, positioned directly beneath one of these air spaces. So uh, you get these incredible sounds, like a, piano, like a piano is falling on the roof of the building and it's, uh, then it's gone it's immediately afterwards. And we've all heard these sounds quite a bit out there. But that was the basic idea, is to kind of recreate some of this. Um, and I did exchange some emails with uh, NASA Langley, who's one of the primary places for uh, doing sonic boom simulation, sonic boom studies. Uh, and they actually liked my recordings better than their own, which was kind of surprising. But I think theirs are designed for data. They're very quiet. They sent me back some of theirs, kind of had this trade of uh, sonic boom samples. Um, but the ultimate goal, of course, now is to get mine played back uh, in their facilities at Langley. I think that would be quite a treat. So maybe we'll reconstruct this on the base at some point. <laughs> I don't know if this is the last image. We'll I see. think so, yeah. So on the jumping ship. It, well, um, we'll be talking <laughs> about CLUI eventually, so um, whatever you want to do. Okay. Back to that. Yeah. Oh, you, okay. But the experience in, in this, on the second floor was was very consuming, um, or because you had the sound kind of coming down from the, the cones, and um, and Steve actually installed what, what's called a, a butt kicker, which is a uh, the magnetic kind of driver that is subsonic, and uh, 
fiber that makes the whole structure kind of resonate. And, uh, yeah, the uh, infrasonic uh, device that actually will kind of vibrate the floor, basically. And so it was, I think, um, you know, it was a nine minute composition that had varying tones, of, like, much more consuming than, than uh, being out here in the open. And so, yeah, some people, were, they were kind of at once uh, frightened, but then some said they were also kind of soothed at times, you know, by the low end vibrations. And um, so we were just into this idea of this unnatural atmospheric phenomenon that's phenomenon that goes that goes on around us. Um, that, uh, and specifically re reacting to this glass lobby space, which is harsh and difficult, especially as a as a as an art exhibition space. Yeah, giving it a sonic element, kind of, yeah, kind of wafted throughout the building, and uh, it's not a it's not a friendly place, right? In terms of as an art space, so being harmonious with the Hadid to a certain extent, both in lines and color, or lack of color, and to be kind of aggressive and contradictory to the space over here with the wood and uh, not so ordered kind of the design. Yeah, and it was, uh, what else was there? Anyway. On the second story? Yeah. Which is the fire escape. We had to they they made us put a second set of stairs in uh, that day of the opening. It's kind of exciting. They couldn't see it as a sculpture, I guess. It's, but anyway. <coughs> we, did, we did actually have to change some tiles in the Contemporary Art Center piece uh, because the fire marshal didn't like how many sprinkler heads we were blocking. So there's an acoustic compromise in terms of uh, replacing the, the, the black tiles with the, the plastic grate that can let water go through. So we're going back to 2000. This piece, uh, we, we actually actually moved, moved from New Mexico to, to Chicago to do um, a piece for the Hyde Park Arts Center um, called Free Basin. Um, and it was the skateboarding project. Um, sure. And so we were sort of, yeah, um, just basically wanting to um, do something skate related and then eventually it sussed out into doing the, like a full scale California kidney pool, um, going back to the 1970s um, skating the history of skating um, in pools when there wasn't a proper surf uh, on certain days. So uh, we basically bisected the gallery. This is the underside, and you walk up a spiral staircase um, um, to, to stand on the platform. This is a, a later installation. You'll see the top of the original installation in a minute. And so the idea was to just make a create a forum, an ideal forum for, for skateboarders. Um, to perform and uh, keep it free. Um, so we jumped through a lot of hoops and figuring this out. Um, and uh, lots, you know, realized there were lots of kind of um, preconceptions about skaters and um, as being kind of a, uh, what? A threat to architecture. A, a threat to, <laughs> yeah, um, uncontrollable and whatnot. But uh, found that they were very glad to have this and, you know, very amicable to whatever was required. So this is a 2004 installation at right. Deitch Gallery. Um, as a site-specific project, it's compromised a little bit, um, but not too much that it didn't make sense ultimately. Um, Yeah, so it's shown in five different places. The last place was a uh, Yerba Buena, the uh, Yerba Buena Center in San Francisco. Um, I went to Germany uh, for a big international exhibit. Um, and on the lower right is the opening, uh, the first opening, because we didn't get the platform installed in time. Um, so this was not just us, it was a cast of, uh, Characters to get it done and built, um, uh, design from designing to installing it was a 
real big push, a real effort. Um, the Hyde Park Art Center has a, a it was a, a ballroom uh, in the 1930s, so yeah. but it had been you know painted over and adjusted and and decisions bad decisions made about re renovation. Um, so kind of responding to that formal um, part of its design originally, uh, I think inspired us to to do to put this on stage kind of. So for us it was a sculpture and we really didn't know what the skaters were going to do with it. Um, you know, and then, so, I mean, we did do research talking to skaters about the design and, um, um, the event, yeah, it just was a whole, a long, about a year in planning and whatnot. Trying to satisfy uh, beginners as well as veterans and uh, turned out pretty access, pretty appropriate for any level, I guess. There should Something. be a video. Oh, wait. Sorry. It's all right. Clumsy maneuver. Do that again. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Sorry. Um, where was that? Volume? But it was. Uh, it's yeah. It was. Try it at about. Forty feet long. Perfect. Twenty-four feet wide. And seven feet deep. Mario. This is Mario Rubacala. Rubacala. He's in Rocket from the Crypt. And had skated for Tony Alva in the past. And this is Lance Mountain, who came to visit. Uh, he's, yeah. This is Chris Baker, who lives in San Francisco. Sloppy Josh, who was a great enthusiast of the project. Join the join the crew. Join the crew. This project was beyond the, the scope of the, the normal project at the Hyde Park Art Center, so they had to kind of grow into that knowing how to do that and it became a, a open all all hours kind of taken care of by skaters kind of thing, which was nice. some building shots um, and we had done both the shallow and the deep end and then with a couple of weeks till the opening realized you know we didn't quite know how to join them very well I mean we had no idea or we imagined we'd figure it out or it would come to us and then um, instead we met a physicist in Chicago named Peter Ang who was a former, former skater himself and he's a physicist works at Argonne Labs and, and uh, University of Chicago um, and he did computer modeling to basically give us uh, templates to um, build uh, build from in order to join the shallow and deep end. One of his renderings. Um, so he was, he kind of saved the day for us on that. Uh, this is a rendering of the, the bowl that's at the Supreme store in West Hollywood. Yeah, this is a newer one that he, he did the whole, he rendered the whole thing from the beginning on this one. Um, so this one became, it was nice to have a second chance to do it. Uh, this one became more refined and uh, um, and it was a commission for the Supreme Skateboard Company that opened a store two years ago in West Hollywood. Um, and I'm going to go there tomorrow and skate if anyone is interested. We should, we should talk. <laughs> Especially if they're my age or something, much more comfortable. <laughs> and this is uh, just a more a working a drawing we work from. It's a bad match, but basically the way Peter, you know, Peter had to kind of learn a program. Solid works. 
SolidWorks to do this. Um, then he put it in a, a CAD and, and it spit out the drawings. Um, so none of us know anything about the computer <laughs> stuff much. And um, but he worked with us. He was very, uh, you know, he was very easy to work with, and we had a lot of very productive exchange getting it done. 27 pieces. Um, this is in preparation for um, maybe its grandest venue, uh, Documenta uh, 11 in 2002, um, at, a, at a brewery, a former brewery building, uh, giant ceilings and uh, its own building, which was great to really bisect the space and kind of not have to uh, be next to some artwork that might not benefit by the, the noise and stuff. Steve um, is an authentic skater. That's him skating in 1977 at the Rainbow, right? In the upper left picture. The Rainbow Skate Park in he, Chicago. He taught me how to skate well enough to get that once in a lifetime picture. Uh, and then a real skater uh, on the right at Documenta. More experimental in Germany. <laughs> They're used to it's square. It's a long way from California. Square pools, yeah. Uh, is this? Oh, it's yeah. On. Okay. This was at Deitch Projects in New York again, um, and that opening was a big extravaganza. Um, and New York was probably some of the. It was basically the, the most appreciative crowd because. It, it uh, was exhibited in the winter, and there are a lot of uh, very good skaters in New York. Um, so a real test for our um, engineering um, decision making. This is Dan Drahobel, who's a pro, uh, doing some great older. That was at the most recent. Uh, Exhibition in Yerba Buena at, in San Francisco, and it's now uh, in semi-retirement in Wendover. The pool. It's available. <laughs> okay, what was that? And then this was the Supreme store, obviously at uh, on Fairfax near Beverly, 439 Fairfax, um, and they sell product, and I think they're doing pretty good. <laughs> And that's a great skate. That's all. <laughs> right. So this takes us to 2001. Um, invited by Hamza Walker at the um, the Renaissance Society uh, at the University of Chicago, he's one of the curators there, and invited us to collaborate and work with Kevin Drum, a, com a minimalist composer. Uh, who we'll play samples of in a minute. And basically the challenge was to provide a, a venue to for music that has can be difficult for a general audience um, to inspire the listeners to invest themselves into the composition more than they might otherwise. So we were faced with this um, gallery with these unwieldy acoustics and that's when we got inspired by this uh, readily available you know, ceiling tile product. Um, easy to hate but very effective and um, sort of changed the recipe a little bit and uh, just dropped it to the floor to create this barrel vault which has this romantic kind of idea of grand space but it's so pedestrian or or lowbrow, I don't know how to describe it. But um, when we found out it was uh, available with a foil back, that's when we uh, fell in love with the Kwanzaa hut. So we'll see that uh, a couple more times. And the um, the equipment here is basically it takes the place of the performer because uh, I think that uh, type of music doesn't necessarily need you don't really need to watch a performer on stage. And it so looks this like this. 
looks like this <laughs> guy behind the laptop. But uh, um, so his composition was about an hour long um, in three parts, and um, yeah, our thing was to create an ideal listening situation and uh, for this what some people might consider to be challenge, you know, challenging uh, music. We have two one-minute clips. The next image is of a second installation, also at Documenta 11, sort of highlighting the interior-exterior qualities of it. Um, and so the clip, I think, will start right away, hopefully at a good volume. So it had. Wait, wait. It had quite a range from uh, subtle to um, some more caustic moments and some very low end, uh, low end tones. Um, the other sample will uh, test the bass, I think, of these this setup here. I'm not sure sure we're at the right volume. I'm not. I'm hesitant to do that again. Oh, you can control the volume for that channel here okay. too. Okay. But yeah, I think the low is cut off. Yeah. Anyway, Kevin um, takes analog um, samples of sounds and then manipulates them and creates formal compositions. So it's not an improvised kind of thing. Although he does work that way. He he made a, I guess like the Gloom and Doom project. He had a, a collection of sounds and we had a collection of interest with the material and he finished his composition as we finished the structure. Um, as I said this is the second installation so it's not quite uh, living up to the site specificity it was designed for. But the, 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 the venue was close enough that, that it wasn't uh, we, that we should do it, that we did it. Yeah. That's Kevin composing. <laughs> okay, here's another. They're sitting on um, the benches. Basically, became the subwoofer with the the mid and high range in the in the walls of the structure. I don't know if we're hearing it now, but you would be feeling it if you were one of these eighth graders, lucky eighth graders. Um, so, it's, we hear it. Yeah. The bench became 72 feet long, kind of glued up, continual wood, engineered wood product. Um, sort of a, we were eager to to be on the floor gluing this up after assembling this erector set kind of product. It had a kind of had a warm quality about it, so um, 
which was nice and it kind of served as a communal uh, brought you together with the other listeners uh, so it was I mean originally the idea was to kind of hold people try to hold people there um, so the long bench was the idea of the communal bench or kind of a continuous of conduit for people um, and it became kind of a big uh, what uh, craft project in contrast to the to the shell of the hut with some considerations for optical trick not trickery but sort of playing with perspective and seeing what that can do over that length and anticipating traffic patterns and again designing uh, a way for the viewers or listeners to move about the space and be stay there longer <laughs> and um, so they would have if they walked across it they'd be there at least a minute you know? so uh, we thought about other things like closing them in with doors and stuff but it, it never came to that fortunately and it did in the end uphold people pretty well There's the uh, reviled uh, grid, but the the trust work in that space was we wouldn't have come to this decision without that. So we really need to 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 see the kind of conditions of the of the exhibition opportunity to to design a project we 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 can get behind, I guess. Yeah. And there was some kind of linkage we felt with the uh, Native American longhouse uh, as being a communal space or, you know, and, and the gallery happened to be on the right axis, east-west, um, so uh, that was some minor inspiration. Or justification. Or justification. There's no sound. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we like to think that we made the world's longest subwoofer. Um, we're not quite positive, but... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, we were we found out about the Center for Land Use Interpretation in 1997. Um, actually, on our way to uh, put up that stick and plastic trailer in Ogden, Utah, and we decided on the first day of getting there to go for fun, just to go to the the border of Nevada, uh, straight west of Salt Lake City, and uh, get a cheap motel room and a buffet and. So we went there and stayed overnight, and on the way back we, uh, we, we pulled up right alongside the CLUI van heading... With a bunch of sticks and stuff on our van. We had the sticks? No. Yeah. Okay. We had our sticks for the stick and plastic trailer, I guess. <laughs> I, anyway, we pulled off at the same gas station and... Reading the article about the CLUI and art papers or something? Or art issues or uh, something in LA. So, chatted. Uh, one of their agents and then uh, <laughs> gave them some press our first probably our first press we ever received and uh, wrote a proposal and then went there in 1999 oh, go ahead okay well so yeah yeah they they do this stuff there <laughs> uh the enola gay was there the uh largest american air base was there starting in the 40s right yes tested rocket cars because the the natural flat terrain and of course the gambling and it was the, yeah, the site of the, for um, the training of uh, the bomber pilots and the B-29 and was it Boxcar? Or Boxcar was the other one? Boxcar, um, before it went to uh, the South Pacific. But there's hope to uh, turn this dilapidated airbase into a museum. I'm not sure that that is realistic, but they have a model that demonstrates what it used to look like in the museum in the airport gift shop. Uh, and in 1999, our first project there was to um, make the um, construction trailer more livable. Um, so, so we were there for a couple of months and uh, made, built a kitchen and uh, an extra room and, and reconfigured it a little bit and um, did various improvements so it would be a nicer place to live. The Center for Land Use Interpretation offers a residency program for people like us and we figured out that we could uh, make our um, 
our, our expressive artwork serve the center in a real practical way, um, thus making our investment better. <laughs> um, so, so this was designed for our other artists to come live in, to bring them to closer to this surreal landscape and political situation. And we had some license to do more, I guess, less orthodox things or less conventional things. Um, so because of the, their clientele, so to speak, being more open to um, <laughs> something different. How about a room over there? Kind of curve, make a curve thing. <laughs> okay, so so we basically uh, did our version of a kind of decadence kitchen kind of thing. Um, and you'll see the, the kitchen that we were glad to use when we got there. You hear about an artist in residency program and you imagine somebody sliding you a basket of food under your door in the morning or something. But we get to this kitchen, which was really um, maybe more appropriate to what I, we think uh, is an, a fun kind of... <laughs> Closer to a meth lab maybe, and, but um, <laughs> still very functional. And, uh, so our kitchen, we glean you know, from kicking around there, uh, certain ideas, you know, used concrete and made a heavy concrete sink base and um, truck bed liner on the floor and uh, crippled uh, table on wheels. And, uh, but we found that we really enjoyed Wendover for its, it's had a certain, you know, to most people it has an excess of scarcity of sorts, but uh, we found it to be kind of a rich environment or a certain former base to be kind of a, an autonomous zone or something. As, as controlled as the air base kind of can be or feel, it's uh, it seems like the Wild West or the, the frontier in a sense, so really kind of enjoyed that. Uh, just the, the back room, we had to build this extra door, which became more like a hatch, um, from inspired probably by airplane hatches or something in basements. Basement. Uh, sort of gleaned a little bit of history and there's the nice production on one side and the destruction on the other. It was a real fast turnaround in World War II. Um, on the southern part of the airbase, which is um, cut off from the general area of the accessible area of town is um, what's called South Base, and uh, the center has rented space there for a number of years, and we saw this building in 1999 and developed a project eventually to to install the first phase of, I guess, in 2003. So this Quonset hut gained, took, got our attention and um, thought about that being developed as a extension to the center's presence there in, in Wendover with their residency program. So it became a practical reason to to use kind of green sustainable energy and that kind of led to other things which we haven't gotten to yet. Um, so, yeah, this the south base is um, a couple of miles from um, the, the main part of the base and so it's off the grid, has no electricity or water anymore um, and since so, damaged who knows what kind of yeah it's been uh, Matt knows. vandalized or it's been used as uh, you know enforcement training center uh, or enforcement training facility and um, anyway. yeah. so we took on the Kwanzaa hut which was in pretty bad shape and stabilized it and um, insulated it and um, chose that as the um, the central facility there. Again, our client was pretty flexible uh, in terms of what that living facility might be. It's kind of skeletal still, but uh, uh, so it currently serves as a living and working space when maybe later it might be just living or just working, I'm not sure. But it is outfitted with, uh, well, there's what it used to look like after we cleaned it up a little bit. Cleaned it up and, yeah. Oh, so we, <laughs> our fenestration was inspired by the bullet holes. Um, 
which were caused not by military activity, but by law enforcement training across the drive there, um, where they where they go out and rent this space and learn how to breach doors and shoot for fun. Right. Yeah, a lot of breaching. <laughs> and, I mean, this might.